Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts Jermaine, how was the move from New York to Arizona? It was like somebody airlifted me. Really? It was unbelievably smooth. Going to Arizona was not exactly on any of my big plans. And I had one of my students, a wealthy businesswoman in Australia, received a message on my behalf that said I should move to Sedona and that she should give me a large sum of money to make sure it happened. And it worked Mm -hmm. out, huh? And it worked out. I I went to the altar and I said, look, I'm willing to do this if I'm supposed to, but it's going to have to be super smooth and easy. And it was. Wow. It was totally smooth and easy. Well, that's what happens when the divine is in charge. I forgot to ask. Just get out of the way and show up. (laughs) Welcome to On the Edge. The place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. And we have a practical mystic, Maureen St. Germain. Brains, let me tell you, now I've dealt with some people that have dealt in the Akashic Records, but this woman is all over the planet. I mean, you cannot scroll through your Facebook news feed or LinkedIn without seeing some promotion and some information. What is the draw? What makes her so influential and impactful, insightful? Why are people wanting to delve into these ancient records to find out what their future may hold? To answer unanswered questions, the big why. She's also an extremely accomplished author and speaker. She's holding retreats now in her new home uh, in Arizona. And I'm so glad to have her here on the edge. I've been waiting for her. Uh, So I want to get in and I want to get in real deep because I got some questions for her. Okay. Welcome her to the edge today, Maureen St. Germain. How are you? My pleasure to be here with you. And you've done your homework, girlfriends, and that shows. I appreciate that very much. Yeah, well, you know, I don't treat my, my guests like sloppy seconds. You are on the edge, and that is a, a prominent place. I want to promote you. I want to respect <laughs> you. And I want to get to know you. I do, and I want my brains to get to know you. So let's uh, let's talk. Let's go back first, and then we'll talk about the Akashic Records, because there's a lot to delve into. I mean, volumes and That's volumes right. and volumes, right? That's right. That's right. So how did you get involved in this? And uh, tell me a little bit about your history and your, you know, your story, how you show up in the world. Okay, so I've always been very uh, spiritually inclined. When I was a little girl, I was reading Lives of the Saints, a big thick book that my mom had, kind of like a big dictionary. And um, it was a beautiful book. It was gold leaf with gold edges. And one day it wasn't in the bookcase where it was supposed to be. So I I remember asking myself, I wonder where it went. And as soon as I posed that question in my head, I saw a picture of the living room closet on a high shelf. So I got a chair and climbed up on the chair and pulled the book out and, you know, did the reading I wanted to do and then put it back in the bookshelf where it belonged. And of course, I'm laughing today as a mom. I can imagine that my mom thought, I don't want her to get this thing all messed up. You know, I want it to be nice. And her little girl fingers, you know, messing with it. But of course, when I put it back, instead of putting it back in the closet, I was sending her a message. Hey, I'm on to you. Don't do that. Mm. It's hilarious, right? And my mother was very plugged in as well. I remember her. So you said that your mom was very uh, in tuned as well? Mm -hmm. Very much so. She knew a lot of things. I remember when I was uh, in high school, now I grew up on a farm and I wanted to be a majorette and there was no um, willingness to pay for lessons or to take me to lessons. So it was, apparently it was frivolous. I don't know what the deal was, but I was never given the green light to um, get baton lessons. So when I was a freshman, they announced in January, we're going to do tryouts in May for the um, uh, majorette team. And there was one slot open and there were five girls trying out. Mm. 
And I came home that in January and said to my mom, um, I've been thinking all day. And she said, you know, if you still want to take baton lessons, I'd be okay with that. I never had to ask. Wow. And so then I lined it up. I took the lessons. And, and of course, I was the one that got in and no one else did. I worked my butt off because <laughs> I went from zero to whatever to make that happen. Right. So, so that's what so life that's how it was, is going from zero to five. We hope anyway. <laughs> so um, as a young adult, I read the Edgar Casey books and I've always been very interested in mysticism and spiritual things. So um, more recently, maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, maybe, maybe longer. Yeah, maybe more like 20 years ago now that I think about it. I was um, given a message that I was um, being given access to a dimension that had been closed to humanity for eons. And that was the work that I was doing in the Akashic Records. And then one day in a, in a very sassy moment, I said to myself, so am I the only one who has access to this dimension? And the answer was no, but you will be a way shower for millions. And so as a teacher of the Akashic Records, I have a big devotion to the students to make sure they get it and to make sure they understand. And I have lots of tools and lots of techniques. And that's why they call me the practical mystic because I'm very down to earth and very practical. You know, I raised four sons oh, wow. and I was a single parent for about half of that time. And um, you learn a lot when you need to. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. So tell us and define for us the Akashic Records. I like to call it the windows to the soul. And uh, Edgar Cayce uh, was asked, you know, where are you getting your information from? And he said, the Akashic Records. And the word Akasha stands for sky in Sanskrit. So some people think of the word Akasha as a, um, a, a do you see my hand sweating, by the way? That oh. is, <laughs> that is my connection. So any of you who have sweaty hands, it's a, it's a big sign that your, your connection to source is pretty strong. Anyway. Um, so, so Akasha stands for sky and Edgar Casey, when he was queried deeper, uh, said, well, it's the book of life that's listed in the old Testament. And so I like to think of the Akashic records as the big database in the sky that holds all the information of our past, our present and our possible and probable futures. It's not really used for prediction as much as it is used for understanding the present moment. Because if you can understand the present moment, you can make better decisions for the future. And I like to tell people, you know, think of it as an open book test. Life is, is full of surprises. And when you have the open book test capacity, that means you go into your chemistry exam with a table, or you go into the math exam with the calculator, you have the capacity to be successful. You know, you know what I'll say what buttons to push or what to look at. So opening the Akashic Records helps you understand the situation in a way that helps you choose the highest possible choice. And the big reason that it's so popular right now is because we're at the end of an era. We're at the end of a cycle. Humanity is getting ready to level up to another level of humanity where we're more yeah. kind to each other, we're more concerned about each other, and we're as concerned about each other as we are about ourselves. And so the whole dynamic is shifting. And I'll give you an example. One time a guy called in on a radio show and he explained that he was a really good father and that he had done, you know, everything he could think of to be a good dad. And um, he was a meditator and, you know, he had all these things about himself. And his daughter, her 20 something, was still treating him horribly and he couldn't figure out why. And he wanted to know what the record keepers had to say. And they said, you two were adversaries in a past life. And you moved on and grew spiritually, and she did not. And you agreed to sponsor her in this lifetime. She still sees you as her adversary. And she's not feeling safe around you yet. And what you can do to help that along is to love her anyway and to treat her as if she were treating you the way you wanted to be treated. And over time, she will shift. And then they said, it may take a few years. Now, as a parent, you know, when you have a, a son or daughter that's acting out, you know, you don't want that, you want that to get fixed right now. You don't want to wait right, right, <laughs> a couple right, of years. Right, right. 
But when you get told it could take a couple of years, what happens is you calm down because you know, I just have to show up. I just have to be the good parent I've always been, birthday presents, calls, thank yous, whatever, and it'll take care of itself. And if it doesn't get, guess what? You can still sleep at night because you've done what you were supposed to do. Exactly. You showed up. And speaking of showing up, what type of, well, I shouldn't say what type of individuals, what would be the characteristics? What would be the desire of the perfect client to go and um, explore the Akashic Records and become a, is it a practitioner? Is it a mystic? What do you actually call the facilitator? Uh, the people who facilitate the records in my lineage are called Akashic Records Guides. Nice. And um, what I'm looking for in a candidate is somebody who is willing to learn and who is willing to do the tool practice, the tools I've given them, uh, like the piano teacher expecting a student to practice. And if they will do that, they will be successful. And the other part of that is a high level of integrity, you know, and one of the things I ask people to do is really examine their own behavior towards themselves. And, and just as an aside, I highly recommend a book by Brad Blanton called um, Radical Honesty, because when a person reads that book, they realize, oh, I have been telling little white lies here and there. You know, I, and I'll give you an example. You know, when my first husband, um, when I was married to my first husband and I bought a birthday present for my, for our son, I was in a difficult situation and I didn't have time to go anywhere else. So I ended up buying a very expensive backpack. And he asked me how much it was. And instead of telling him it was $39, I think I said it was 19 or some ridiculously low price. <laughs> and um, because I didn't want to get into a fight. Right. You know, we do those things. Now I don't do that. I tell the truth. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe in that. Tell the truth and shame the devil. You know, uh, you have to show up. You have to be accountable. For your actions, you have to take ownership. You're going to make mistakes. Things are going to happen. Right. That's right. But I and can't stand a liar. A liar just, you know, it, I just have no use for them because the truth well, is going to come out eventually. This is something that um, all the young mothers who are out there, I'm going to give you a piece of advice, and that is stop teaching your children to lie. And why and how do you do this? <clears throat> when you ask your son or daughter, did you do X, Y, Z, eat all the cookies, um, spill that you know, stuff all over the floor, whatever it is, you know, that they have done, you know, they've done it. They're going to lie and they're going to lie because they love mom and they don't want to disappoint her. And they truly desire to be in mom's good graces. It's far better to say, oh, there's, there's Kool-Aid all over the floor in the kitchen. Let's go wipe that up. I need some help here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So how does that translate to adults? that are big fat liars. You know, I think people lie for one of three reasons, Marie. Either they're trying to get over, uh, there is a low self esteem and they want to bolster themselves up or there's some trickery. And so again, you can kind of tell that. And when you're dealing with someone that is this close to you, that is in your heart centered space, dealing with Akashic Records, they're dealing with a lot of your personal emotions. They, uh, the client is entrusting that you are going to be, again, a guide, that they are going to keep your secrets, um, that you are going to be a person that's going to mentor and mold them. So it's a lot of responsibility, but there's a lot of trust. So on the other side of this, when you are looking for a guide, because everybody is not everybody's client, let's face it, what kind of synergy should a person be looking for when they seek out a guide? Ah, that's a good question. Well, what I have found is that everyone is different um, and people come to the table with different skills. So one of our guides, for example, is knowledgeable about uh, healing and body and can read the body very well. Another guide has had a, has a son that's developmentally disabled. So she's gonna have insider understanding about that because they're always going into the records for themselves as well as any client that they have. So whatever skills these uh, people have, we, we play those out and we, we put them on the website and we also put an interview with each one of them talking about themselves and what they bring to the table so that 
when you're deciding who to have a session with, you get to see their personality, you get to see what their, what their experience level is, and that helps you make up your mind on who you want to work with. Um, I did write a little freebie book on um, how to put, pick out an Akashic Records guide. And if I can put my hands on it and send it to you, and you can just make it available to your listeners if you want. Oh, well, that would be wonderful. Because okay. I want them to delve into that. I want them to be exposed to as many different options and modalities as possible. You know, what do you say to the person that says that this is hoo-hoo, that this is uh, witchery, that this is not um, authentic? And let me tune you into something else, too, Brains. Uh, one of my most favorite people on the planet, my virtual boyfriend, Einstein, was even into the Akashic Records. So this is nothing brand new. This didn't just uh, come up, you know, spring up like a dandelion. But what do you speak, <laughs> what do you say to the skeptic? I tell them two things. Do you, would you like to check it out and find out for yourself? And if they say yes, then we open up the records and have a session and then they find out. Um, or I say, well, you're entitled to that opinion and I champion your uh, right to hold that belief as long as it pleases you. I'm not interested in convincing somebody who wants to have a, a little tete-a-tete, you know, and there are people that take up with you for the purpose of proving themselves right instead of me. And I just as soon agree with them. You're fine. You're fine if you want to hold that belief. But I find that it helps me a lot. And I have, you know, thousands of clients that would say the same thing. It's up to you. Is this in contrast with a religious doctrine? No, actually it isn't. And this is very interesting. Um, back in the 30s when Edgar Casey was alive, one of the things that came through in the Akashic Records for him in his sessions was that he had been a pharaoh in another lifetime. And <clears throat> he um, had trouble with that, but it kept coming through over and over in different ways. So in his traditional Christian belief system, reincarnation, for example, didn't play into that. But by the time he got to a certain point in his life, he accepted that reincarnation was real. So that's a classic example where someone's belief system um, in their religion gets stretched or expanded, but it doesn't take away from the original. It simply allows for more than what was available before. And so it isn't a religious belief or a religious doctrine. What it is, is a tool to help us all be better human beings, because that's what it's all about, is how can I make a better decision? Now, I've had a guest that was on my show that was amazing. Uh, she told me that when she goes into the Akashic Records, that she knocks three times and she comes to this big giant wood door and it opens up and there's three little, I mean, two little miniature men that come to greet her. They take her to the same place. She sits at this table and she works there and she opens up these volumes and volumes of books. I had another uh, individual that told me that when she enters the Akashic Records, that she's in a trance-like state that she's able to communicate, uh, that she's able to be more clairvoyant, that she's able to hear things, and she channels. Each person is individual, and they are going to access this differently. How do you access the records? Well, before I uh, answer that, I'd like to comment on the other two people. I think that the first story is a very good example of what people could use in their mind's eye of what is happening whether I register that whole scenario or not. We definitely do not go into the records. We are at the threshold. So there's that validation there. And when we um, access the records, we're using a very specific uh, energetic prayer. We don't knock three times, we use a prayer. We use a prayer three times. And then we allow that information to flow through us. And what happens is in the training, we teach you to discern between your own, I'll call it wisdom channel, your own higher guidance and the Akashic records. And they are different and they're substantially different. Normally when a person starts to get connected to their wisdom channel, everything that comes through they think is their wisdom channel. But if you start to discern what's coming in from the record keepers, you are able to actually have the capacity to see the difference. And I'll give you a couple of examples. 
One of them is what I call the hammock effect. When you're in the Akashic Records, you feel this tremendous love and um, embracing feeling. And it's just like when you get in the hammock, you know, how, how we put babies in bunting, you know, we tight, tighten them up, make them feel like they're in the womb. And that's a very loving feeling. And then we also have a sensation in our body. Some people feel the energy coming in on one side or the other, or sometimes they feel pressure on their chest. Um, so that's another marker. Another marker is a sound. And for me, that's my biggest marker. And what happens is I hear what um, you and I might call white noise, but it's in my head. It's not out there. And, you know, the white noise becomes really solid. And then the information just flows on top of that. And my own thoughts then are behind that. So, I, you know, I rarely have personal thoughts when I'm in the records. How do you cleanse yourself? How do you make sure that you are a clear conduit that, you know, your channel is clear for facilitating messages for others? I am so glad you asked that. So many teachers of the Akashic Records don't do that. And I teach people how to clear themselves with a stainless steel knife. And I have a couple of YouTube videos that are free that people can watch on how to do that. But you cut around the body and you call in Archangel Michael. Um, that's one way. I also have a team of people who do remote clearing work. And they are um, um, what I call the big guns. So that, you know, if you have something that's, you know, somehow affecting you and you haven't been able to clear yourself, then you call on these guys and they do the deep clearing work and they deal with heavy duty uh, um, situations where people are possessed by, you know, strangers or parents or something like that, or by angry energies or black magic or witchcraft, all that stuff that's being projected onto them. They're able to handle all of that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have a pretty good system in that way. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that clearing is absolutely essential to be a good channel. Otherwise, you're you're limited in your capacity. Absolutely. And also, you're taking on a lot of trauma. You're taking on a lot of stress. Uh, this can affect your mental, physical, financial health, all of that. You mentioned something that is very, um, very important that people want to know. When you open yourself up to this, I had my first Reiki session, for example, and uh, I was completely drained. And the facilitator told me, he says, you know what? You are a force. You have a lot of energy. But be careful with that because there's energy thieves. There are people that will come in and rob you of that. So when you open yourself up, you're vulnerable. You're naked. Your soul is naked. How does the person protect themselves with the guide from evil entering in? Not that the, the uh, guy from the Akashic Records is going to do that. But when you open yourself up, you know, anything can come in. Well, your, your point is very well taken. And I agree with you that that's so. Um, in my version of the prayer that we use, we actually call in the ascended masters by name. And then we ask our higher self to assist us being in our 5D self, our fifth dimensional ascended master version of ourselves. So we're rising above the 3D watermark, if you will. And then we ask God to put a shield around us and that <clears throat> it seals both me and the client. And that way we're, our channel goes directly up. And, and finally, and this, this applies to all Akashic guides, there is a portal or a stargate that we are all accessing. And what happens is when we make that clear intention, we do the work. And, and many people use this prayer, for example, it, it slides us right into that channel. So we're not going through the astral realm and higher realms to get there like the old time shamans did. Instead, we're going directly like a direct line. Mm, okay, so you're going linear, okay? You know, I, well, I, I, I like to think of it as, as angled up. Oh, angled up, okay. <laughs> yeah. so you're going angled up, brains, you have to put your blinkers on. <laughs> <laughs> you're going right in this brings you great joy what other things in life bring you great joy walks in nature bring me great joy my grandchildren bring me great joy um, I like to learn and read so I get a lot of joy from 
you know, growing my knowledge base. And finally, my, the thing that gives me the most joy is teaching. And people see it, it just come alive when you're teaching or when you're speaking with uh, people. And it's because that's what I came here to do. So doing what you came to do gives you great joy. Absolutely, you'll feel like you never worked a day in your life. You exactly. dedicated your entire life to this. Um, how long is the training for a guide? Everyone is different. Some people get it. Some people don't get it. Some people, you again, turn to the big guns, but on an average. Uh -huh. Well, um, we do a fast track so people can learn to open their own records in a two-day window and then learn to open up uh, someone else's records in another two-day window. Um, but we do require that you spend a certain amount of time in what we call the higher self practice, which takes six weeks. And we also require a large number of um, full length sessions. And then they have to sit for their exam and then they can be certified. So a person could get certified if they were on, if they were really focused and paying attention, they might go from not doing any of this um, to a fully certified guide, maybe in six months to a year. Um, most people do it within a year. I keep it 100 with my brains. How many people have, okay. I said, I keep this 100 with my brains. That means I tell them everything, pros and cons. Have you run into people that have not been able to complete yeah. that for whatever reason? Well, you know, it's funny. The, the, the bigger opposition is the dark forces. So there are people who are either possessed or mentally ill, mentally unstable, that are channeling dark stuff. And, you, you know, I wouldn't certify them. Um, it, and that's unfortunate because they really need to do clearing work and try and fix what's going on for them before they can be a guide. Um, I have failed people in their exam and my team has also failed people, but we generally encourage people who fail to come back. And I, I, you know, I can only think of one time that somebody didn't come back and I don't remember now what happened, but you know, I have, I have a lot of people who have gone ahead and gotten certified, maybe even been in my inner circle of guides and then move on because, you know, I'm shepherding these people and some of them want to stay and help others and some of them want to go out on their own. And usually people who go out on their own don't last right. because you really do need support. Right. And also you can use this modality in concert with other things. Can you use it with Reiki or emotional freedom technique, hypnotherapy? Well, you know, I don't, I don't do Reiki. And, and so I can't speak to Reiki other than I know a lot of people are, are um, um, using Reiki up to a point. And then they recognize that it's, it's a template and it's, it's, it's like scaffolding and the scaffolding doesn't go as high as you're capable of going. So a lot of people are like, you know, unhooking from some of the Reiki attunements and then using other techniques, emotional freedom technique. That work is so phenomenal. It's just remarkable. And I have a regular practitioner that I go to, for yeah. example. Um, so, you know, I, e even at my level, I'm not afraid to look at myself and say, you know what, I could use some help here. Exactly, because we all need help. We're always ever evolving. Is there a lot of NLP, neuro linguistic programming? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but I've had a number of people tell me that the work that I'm doing is similar to NLP, because they've studied NLP and they're now studying with me. But I, I can't speak to that because I don't know what it is, to be honest. So what do they have to look forward to when they come to this wonderful retreat space that you have designed uh, exclusively? Um, let's see, I'm, I'm not sure. We, we, I have a private retreat that I'm doing with people who are in my annual program called the Ascension Institute. And that's a private uh, membership group that I work with for a year and they pay a, a, a specific fee for the privilege of having, you know, like a lot of devotion of my time and energy. And they get a lot. And it gives me then the freedom to be out there in the world and to help larger groups of people with the free stuff. Um, so that retreat is, uh, like I'll use the word closed to the members of, of, for this year. If someone's interested in the Ascension Institute, they can go onto my website and look at the things that we do in the Ascension Institute. And then, over time, 
um, if they want to apply, we take applications usually in the spring for the fall semester. So, um, but I have done uh, events in my house. I did an event uh, earlier this year that um, was called the annual youthing event. And it allows you to tap into the um, African tradition of youthing where it was believed that the full harvest moon and the horizon met in such a way that you could roll back this year and last year and connect to a previous year and gradually get younger and younger. And I have- hey, well, don't, don't use 2020 and 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start rolling back from 2019, okay? Because well, again, we're keeping the wisdom and we're re re recapturing our youthfulness. How's that? Okay. So you've been able to look at this with an eagle eye view. What is all of this and the COVID-19 and the, uh, the, the emotion that's been drawn up and the fear mongering or whatever you want to call it, what has it taught you and how has it helped you to help your guides um, really work with clients that are on, you know, on that axle because everybody's on angst. I have written probably three times or more on my monthly blog post about fear. And as a matter of fact, my current blog post is about fear and how it can control you and how there is what I would call a mass consciousness fear that's like a hairnet around the earth. And when we have a little bit of fear, we tap into the big fear if we're not careful. Um, what it has taught me is to stay focused on outcomes and to do my own research, not take uh, everything you hear on the news as gospel or as the truth, and to love people no matter what their choices are. And that can be tricky for some people. You know, and uh, I'll tell you, let me interject right there because I'm not an unconditional lover. You don't believe in it? Uh, no, I don't. I put it this way. Do I practice it? No, there's conditions on my love. I don't, you know, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. It's like, you know, I have, uh, an adoring love for you as a human being, but you come up with something that is just not in my wheelhouse. Um, uh, no, my conditions on my love change, you know, like for well, that's why, that's why I say to people, you're entitled to hold that belief system as long as it pleases you. As well, as long as it pleases you. I don't, I don't know if it, I don't know if it pleases me. I don't know if it hinders me. It's working, and and maybe I um, sugarcoat it or cover it or blanket it as a boundary. You know. Well, okay. So let's just dive a little bit deeper into that for a half a second. I don't put up with anything either. But that doesn't mean I can't, you know, there are people who go on the attack if they don't, if you don't believe what they believe. Oh, no, That's I'm not like I'm that. Saying. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I'm not aggressive with that. But, you know, as far love to me encompasses so many things, not just an emotion and not just a feeling. It's an honor. It's a duty. It's a respect. Uh, it's a collaboration. It's an energy. It's a force. That's a whole lot to be given. And it's not reciprocal or it's but, but see here here's the thing when you're so plugged into source you have all you need so you have extra you can give away okay i want to hold on to mine <laughs> <laughs> i'm just you know like i said i'm just i'm just keeping it real i'm but i'm not well here, i'm not I, here know, to I'm, I'm cut out of a different cloth than yeah and job. everybody <laughs> is but i'm real with mine and i you know i, I do i struggle with it no, I don't struggle with it because I'm aware of it. Again, love to me is like trust. I don't automatically trust people. I never have. Maybe that's... Oh, no. I don't think love is like yeah, trust at all. Because, because trust, I agree with you. Not yeah, everyone trust is, is trustworthy. Well, but, but trust is contingent on something else. 
you know, it's like a bad relationship. Okay, so the guy, <laughs> the, the, the guy cheats on the on the woman, right? And they get back together, and she goes, "Oh, okay, Bob. You know, we're gonna get back together. However, I have this rule and that rule, and if you don't call me, and if you don't do this, and if you don't, uh, you know, if I check your phone and you know it's locked or whatever, I don't trust you. Okay, well now you are gonna trust me contingent upon something else. No." It, it just doesn't work for me that way. And, well, you know, I think you're, I think you're onto yeah. something. There's a wonderful book. There's a wonderful book called when your lover is a liar that really cuts through what you just said. And so I'm, I'm in total agreement with you there. And I, I will also add that I don't see trust the same as love because just because you love someone doesn't mean you trust them. And I think that that's, I think that's a misnomer. That, well, if you love me, you, you trust me. Let's yes. But don't you think they're intertwined? Don't you think that trust is also no, no love? I don't. No, I don't. And see, that's the manipulation. I think that people who use so-called trust and say, if you trust me, you would love me. If you love me, you would trust me. That's BS. That's that's a manipulation of trust. Trust is earned, as you have already said. Trust comes with boundaries and a price tag, so to speak. And th that that doesn't mean you can't love someone you know, let's say love them from afar. So why isn't love earned? Love doesn't have to be earned because it's universal. Okay. All right. Well, we'll agree to disagree <laughs> and not even disagree, <laughs> not even disagree, but it's a different perspective, you know, and I, I question myself. I question, you know, uh, you know, I have a conversation with God. He knows exactly who I am. Uh, I don't have to sugarcoat it with him. And, you know, him, her, it depends on what day it is. It could be her, uh, you know, but again, it's very, very important for people to identify and realize and recognize where they're in this. Just because someone says, and I say this to you with honor, uh, just because someone says you should love someone, I don't necessarily buy that. You know, I think well, I, would, I agree with you there as well. I don't ever want to say you should do anything because who am I? You're Marine St. Germain. <laughs> but I don't have the right to tell you you should do anything. You well, see? Well, no. And so, so I can I can inspire you. I can um, tell you what I think. But really, and this goes back to what you were talking about earlier about boundaries and being able to define your boundaries and know what you're willing, quote, to put up with and what you're will, not willing to put up with. You know, and I think we all have situations where um, things are not exactly ideal but we're not willing to give up the friendship, even though there's, you know, stuff going on. And being truthful with yourself is really important because then you know for sure that you have chosen this. You're not a victim of, you know, like take a woman who's married to a guy who's got some bad habit. Uh, we don't have to say what it is, but just some bad habit. She doesn't like it. And, um, but he's generous to her. He's kind. He's, he's, you know, everything she would want in a man, but she just doesn't like this bad habit. Maybe he throws his clothes all over her. Maybe he smokes and she doesn't want him to smoke or who knows what. She makes a decision to love him anyway. And that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. There's, there's choices and options. There's, exactly. and, and love to me can also be a sacrifice. I, you know, sacrificial lamb that's just how i kind of see it sometimes uh yes. so let's talk a little bit about the pages of your book really quickly you have written it, how many books i've written a ton of books it's true so put that up hold it up so everyone can see it brains look at opening the akashic records look at that look <laughs> at that is that like a, uh, you know, just a quick snapshot? I know that it's a lot more involved and detailed. But this was a gold winner, and it was named Book of the Year and Best Book in its Category. Wow. It was best-selling book in America and Book of the Year in, in the category of, of you know, self-help or whatever it was called. Um, and this is a book on how to open the Akashic Records and how to read for somebody else. And it's so interesting. I even have in here the code of ethics that I expect people to follow oh, if they're going to do this work. So that's amazing. That yeah. is amazing. Well, Maureen, you have just been a wealth of information. Uh, I thank you so much for your 
And I call it a sacrifice because, again, I mean, it's, it brings you joy, but it's something that you didn't have to do. It's something that you want to do, and you want to do it for others, um, not just yourself. It's not just about the money. You know, it's not just about the prestige, um, but there's a true love and there is a true desire to help people get to that 5D dimension of understanding in the age of Aquarius that is much gentler, much kinder. Uh, it's a feminine energy. So I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready to put my bootstraps on. I'm looking at love. Trust me. I got it on my wall right now. <laughs> I'm looking at it <laughs> and what it means to me, you know, and, and what it has done for me. And what it has done to me. So uh, please tell my brains how to get in contact with you if they want to, uh, you know, come to one of your courses, your online courses, connect with one of your guides, or actually, you know, consider taking that deep dive and becoming a guide themselves. That's right. So my website is MaureenStGermain.com. Uh, spelled the same way my name is, all run together without any dots. Um, you can reach us at info at maureenstgermain.com and just type in my name on your search, search engine and it'll come up and then you can check it out. Every month I have something free. This month my freebie is a big deal because it's on fear, which is one of the things you talked about that was so important. And then the freebie is the download to do soul retrieval on yourself. And that lets you bring back a lost bit of yourself when you've had a trauma. Very powerful work. Everybody's been traumatized recently, you know. Um, but there's some generational trauma. There's epigenetics. And so I think that this is a great way if you're really wanting and willing and open to explore that. Akashic Records are there for you with some great guides. Brains, I want to thank you from the bottom of my socks because my heart isn't deep enough. Please go in, like, love, share. You can find Maureen, I'm telling you, she is all over the planet in a beautiful way, in a ray of light with a beautiful aura around her. So go check her out here on The Edge. Bye, Brains. Thank you, April. Thank you.